Coming up on This Week in Radio Tech, SAS is well known for high reliability audio routing systems and now for audio consoles as well. Well, the co founder of SAS, Al Salsi, joins us here on This Week in Radio Tech. We're talking about audio mixing console designs, plus, he's going to share his thoughts on AES 67, Livewire, and Dante. Well, Chris Delvin joins us as well on This Week in Radio Tech. Tword is brought to you by Lavo and the new Ruby Visual Radio Console. Meet the Visual Radio Console, the Ruby, from Lavo. By BSW Broadcast Supply Worldwide, where Let's May a Deal is on. Check it out at bswusa.com. And by Direct Current Broadcast e-newsletter. Get Direct Current in your inbox every Thursday with technical pointers putting you and your facility at an advantage. Hey, welcome into This Week in Radio Tech. I'm Kirk Harnack, your host. Glad to be here. This is our 350th episode of This Week in Radio Tech, the show where we talk about everything from the uh, microphone to the light bulb at the top of the tower. And today, we're going to do a lot of talking about the very critical infrastructure inside the radio station. One of my favorite subjects, uh, it's about audio consoles. And uh, we'll introduce our guest in just a minute. Let's bring in from though New York City or somewhere around that, Chris Tobin is with us. Hey, Chris, welcome in. Hello, Kirk. Yeah, it is New York City and this is a transmitter room behind me or I'm in a transmitter room. These are transmitters behind me. So yes, I'm uh -huh. in New York City. Cool. It looks like you've got, well, thank you. You've got an, an Omnia 6 audio processor behind you and then some other equipment, not all of which I recognize. You want to give us a, a tiny what? little tour? Omnia? Omnia? No, there's no Omnia up here. What are you talking about? <laughs> oh, you've got that all along. That's, uh, that's a uh, Duro 310. Yeah, that's what that is. Sure. Uh, yeah. No. <laughs> it's an Automax. It's Automax, it's Automax <laughs> right. Yeah, Emil Turek signed it. It's, it's sitting shows on the back. Yeah. Yeah, there, there there's uh, Arc Plus behind me, uh, Omnia. Uh, little Omnia box uh, does some fancy stuff with the audio creates stereo there's a HD importer exporter package behind me here and a broadcast devices box on uh, beneath and up above for the RF BDI and then the standard tuner behind me right above yeah. my head on my head so yeah it's pretty simple setup straightforward everything is uh, measured and and kept an eye on so it's good cool but the settings right. you see on the Omnia will change after the show <laughs> Okay, sounds good. All well, right, you know, hey. you know the rules. This is how it works. You, you go to a transmitter site, you see a processor, and everybody starts looking to figure out. They take notes. Ah, yeah, yeah. You know what? Processor companies need to be able to put a fake screen up there with fake settings. See, this is true. How about that? Yeah, I like that yeah. idea. It would work very well in New York, <laughs> Chicago, Boston, and L.A. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Gotcha. I've, I may have a little processor war story myself here later later today about fake, well, about real settings that I, I wish were fake, but they were actually real. But hey, let's bring our guest in because this is all about the guest. This show, episode number 350, our guest is somebody who's really, uh, this guy's personality and enthusiasm just makes every NAB show and every interaction with him just terrific. I'm talking about Al Salsi from Sierra Automated Systems, SAS. They make uh, routing systems and consoles. Al, welcome, um, into Al welcome into the show, buddy. Hey, how you doing, Kirk? Thank you for having me. Pleasure to be here. Good. Good to see you. Hey, uh, by the way, just an uh, inside baseball note, if you could turn that monitor down even more, uh, we're definitely getting some feedback uh, delayed uh, from it. Your mic's picking that oh, up. We can do that. We can do that. Okay. Good deal. Thanks. Hey, um, so welcome into the show. This Week in Radio Tech is where we talk about uh, all the stuff from the mic to the light bulb to the top of the tower. And I love talking about audio consoles. So, um, Al, um, uh, we're going to break for our first ad here in just a second. But if you would, give us give us a little elevator talk. When, when you meet somebody in the elevator and you want to tell them what is SAS and what do you guys do, give us that little speech and, uh, and then we'll head into the meat and potatoes of this after our first ad. Well, sure, sure. Uh, I'd be happy to. I'm uh, the founder of the company, or one of the founders of the company. Uh, back in 1986, Ed and I started um, the company uh, out of our apartments, actually. And uh, in fact, uh, we had product uh, their first NAB in 1987. And um, we actually celebrated our 30th year at, uh, at NAB 
uh, just uh, this last NAB if, if for anybody who was there. Uh, we had a pretty nice little uh, celebration with a press conference and uh, some wine and cheese and some champagne. Um, but we started off with routers, a summing router to allow, uh, because back then there was really no such thing as mixed minus. And um, um, we designed a summing router to take the direct oh. outputs of faders, uh, channels, mm -hmm. uh, set up a mix so you can have multiple mixed minuses. Because back then, the consoles were all analog, only three buses uh, or so. So there just wasn't enough to develop mixed minuses. So um, remember, we had console drop-ins for router select for remote line selectors, and yeah. it found a niche using uh, you know, that for mix minus generation for your different uh, telephone. Because at that time, telephone talk radio kind of was, was, in, was invented at that point. Um, but um, so then we, uh, as we expanded and moved forward, because of course we're always moving forward, uh, we ended up uh, in the digital realm with digital, of course, that brought... Um, uh, a natural progression to the control surface. So the control surface itself um, is a mouse and keyboard, just as you know, and controlling <laughs> DSP engines. And, and then as that progressed forward, of course, now we're audio over IP. Uh, so everything's uh, audio over IP, AS67, uh, Livewire, Dante, Ravenna, stuff like that. So, um, you know, as it, as it uh, progressed down, uh, it's just a different... The same but different, right? I mean, same <laughs> uh, concept uh, with um, control over the DSP engine, a mouse and keyboard type control, uh, but the transport is a little bit different uh, as it evolves, right? First there was MADI, then there was, uh, well, AES, then MADI, then uh, Cobranet, you know, uh, audio over IP layer three, there's audio over layer two, audio over uh, layer two, which is AVB, AS67 now, and... Um, you know, various transports. In fact, other transports that are worthy of a mention is like uh, um, um, USB, FireWire, stuff like that. Although they're not networkable, but it's a good transport. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, so as we it. as we progressed and mm -hmm. got into the digital realm, uh, we're now yeah. we like to look at ourselves as a solutions company, not just a router company or console company. Uh, we provide you know full system solutions for our for our clients and friends uh, as they need. Uh, as their needs grow, we, we, we will provide a solution for their particular application. And every one is uh, somewhat unique, even though it's all the same but different, right? Like your iPhone, <laughs> all the same but different. <laughs> It's safe. They're all set up a little bit differently. We're going to get into uh, all of that coming up in just a few minutes. Uh, we're going to we're welcoming Al Salsi along with uh, Chris Tobin and Kirk Harnack here on this week in Radio Tech, uh, including um, uh, we're going to be also focusing on the aesthetics of design. Why are consoles designed the way they are, and why are our SAS consoles popular, especially among uh, really really big broadcasters? So we're going to check that out coming all coming up in a minute. And you know, Chris Tobin has a bit more experience with um, big city consoles than I do. So hopefully we'll get Chris to participate quite a bit too. Our show, This Week in Radio Tech, brought to you in part by our friends over at Lavo in Germany, lawolavo.com, and uh, they've introduced a, a new audio console themselves. It is the Ruby Visual Radio Console is what they're calling it, Visual Radio console. What what makes it a visual radio console? Well, that's, that's what we're going to find out. Um, it's... It, they, they've taken all of their experience in building those great big consoles, like for uh, uh, live venues, for the Olympics, um, for uh, uh, the BBC, for CBC, for NPR. And they've put this, uh, the smarts they've learned to do, they've put that into a smaller console, the Ruby Visual Radio Console. Um, it's one that it meets and exceeds a lot of the demands that today's radio workplace, which is a little bit different than it used to be, with physical and virtual controls, that's kind of key, virtual controls, that complement each other. Now, they have multi-touch-enabled information displays that let operators adjust uh, things quickly, easily, set up, uh, you know, add another person to the mix, uh, get rid of somebody you don't want to talk to anymore. Uh, On-screen controls and meters that quickly dock to free screen space for other production tools. They have motorized faders that silently assume preset positions instantly. And they have advanced automated functions like auto mix. That's pretty cool. Hands-free mixing. That leaves talent free to create instead of babysitting the levels. And that's just the beginning. There's a, uh, a video on the website. If you're looking at the website right now, if you're watching This Week in Radio Tech, uh, if you're not watching, go to the website at lavo, L-A-W-O dot com slash 
twirt t-w-i-r-t that takes you to a special page they set up that shows all the radio products since this is uh, this week in radio tech lavo l-a-w-o dot com slash twirt there's a video uh, on the ruby page where uh, they take an in-depth look at the ruby console and what its features are and why it's a little bit different than so many other radio consoles are um Lots of power to spare in there. The ability for the DSP to handle up to 4,000 different signals. Um, they do parametric EQ, expansion, compression, limiting, DSing, uh, even delay synchronization uh, mixed to as many as 80 buses, plus MADI I.O., AES67 I.O. as well, and uh, two Ethernet ports on there. Um, very efficient design, and the, you know, the whole engine for this thing fits in one rack unit. So it's very cool. The Ruby console from Lavo, L-A-W-O dot com slash twirt. I hope you'll check them out. And, um, you know, if you talk to uh, one of the salespeople at Lavo, uh, thank them, if you would, for sponsoring This Week in Radio Tech. We really do appreciate it. All right. This Week in Radio Tech, episode 350. And uh, Chris Tobin is with us from a transmitter room. And Al Salsi is with us from a good-looking studio. Is, is Al, are you in a demo room or is this your house? No, this is actually our uh, demo area at the front of the office. So I'm at SAS here now. It's only 2 o'clock, um, our time here. Uh -huh. um, but this, when you walk in, we have a nice um, demo area display here and uh, kind of like a little studio set up. Um, and uh, this is just right in front of our office. We have a, a, a big Rubicon, um, a little uh, rack bay here uh, with an intercom panel and a DSP engine and, of uh, course, a couple of computers. Well, I, I re everything's going in and out of the computer with a uh, AOIP. So our digital oh, yeah. engine here is uh, coming out uh, multi-channels to the uh, computers. Ah, okay. So, so not it's only see, pretty simple setup, uh, really. Yeah, this, this whole show is AOIP. I mean, there's uh, <laughs> we have so many consoles to talk about. At the network center, there is uh, there's an Axia console mixing us and creating mixed minuses. Uh, at your end, you've got the beautiful SAS Rubicon console, and and as you said, you're using uh, an IP driver. It, what is is it running Dante right now on your local network? Uh, yeah, that's that's correct. It's uh, it's a Dante. We chose the Dante system. Um, because they, they have a nice, uh, what's called the Brooklyn module, and um, we use that appliance and bring it in to our DSP engine uh, using um, uh, silicon communicates to each other using uh, what's called I squared S or I squared C. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, of course, we have FPGAs around it, we have some DSP functions around it. Um, so we get uh, essentially 64 channels or 32 stereo in and out uh, of this uh, appliance. Um, and um, it's it's uh, using the nice thing about well all, all of them are very good all, all the AOIP layer three it's a layer three so you've got uh, some that are using IEEE 1588 precision time protocol already uh, such as the Ravenna and Dante was already using it as well um, you have um, others uh, that are using some some of their own clocking mechanisms. And of course, AS67 is in fact using 1588 precision time protocol. Um, so uh, we chose the Dante uh, because of its capacity, IO capacity, and uh, a lot of our products are in blocks of 32. So that's been worked out quite well for us because it's a nice hexadecimal number um, mm. and um, gives us the maximum capacity you know, of that particular uh, block and uh, gives us AS67. Uh, but one of the reasons really why we chose it early on a um, number, number of years ago is because uh, it's AVB ready. And AVB is a completely different discussion. It's a layer two. It's an automatic QoS setting. And we can talk about that a little bit later. Um, but it, 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 it's a hardware um, mechanism that automatically and statically maps from the input all the way from the talker to the listener, and it statically maps throughout every IP hop uh, and reserves that bandwidth and that stream. Um, most of the switches, of course, that was five, six years ago. Um, in in radio, it hasn't really caught on, um, and it and it you know yeah we'll see how it goes you know with that. But um, in the automotive industry, the um, pro sound, live sound. Uh, a lot of those guys are using uh, AVB now um, because of the way uh, it, it reserves that stream 
Um, nothing can break down that stream and, unless uh, either the talker or the listener decide they don't want it anymore or uh, the talker or the listener go away. So then that bandwidth will be freed up for something else. And the neat thing about it is that that bandwidth reservation um, – well, any any AVB switch, of course, will reside on any um, IP network for layer three traffic. Um, mm-hmm. But it, once it's tied up with eighty percent of its bandwidth that's used for audio traffic, it will not allow any more mappings because it says I'm full. Uh, and you'll get an, a, a feedback. The API that's trying to set up the mapping will get a feedback and say, "Oh, uh, we can't set up the stream." You get a do 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 busy signal type thing. And uh, you won't be able to set up the stream. So, um, but that's kind of a, a good because it, on sometimes on the layer three, if the switch gets overwhelmed, um, you might have something fall off. Um, you, you when it when it when it exceeds the bandwidth. But uh, AVB has not been talked about much in this industry anymore because of the onslaught of AES AES sixty seven, which is a great mechanism, yeah. and it's great that we're all coming together to um, be able to. Um, get these protocols to um, different products to talk to each other. So it's pretty neat. So we, yeah, wonder, it's got AAS 67, of course, because and it was already yeah. 1588 clock yeah. as well. Uh, I wonder if um, if you and Chris Tobin might take us back in time at least a, a few years. See, Al, I never worked at stations that were um, big enough to have routers at all, let alone the amazing S routers. I go to stations in different countries and here in the U.S. And uh, when I first started working with the folks at Telos, uh, that that's all I saw at big stations were, were SAS routers. And Chris, come on in here because you, you've got a lot more uh, you know big city experience in market number one than I do. How about, how about you and Al uh, reminisce a bit, a bit about these amazing uh, routers that SAS put out there in the marketplace for so long? Oh, goodness. I mean, we I, I use the routers... Back in my days at ABC News Radio with uh, Steve Densmore, and we used to use it for the let's see the political conventions, uh, breaking news stories. We had special setups we would do things, and we were using a, a laptop and the Matrix software to uh, create or you know uh, make and break uh, cross points. And you know, today people do it with a switch or just they think they're doing it very easily, and it's like wow, this is an inconvenience. You have no idea what it's like to do it on a Matrix on a computer screen <laughs> and a mouse to move around. But uh, the early days was great stuff. Uh, I I still think to this day, Al's approach with the routers and the TDM back phone, the mainframe approach, is what really set the standard. You know, Jack Williams did it with PRD consoles and made a workflow that people could reliably uh, replicate. And Al's products in the early days were looked at as a you know you 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 went in with an SAS thirty two thousand or a sixteen, and you said, okay, I know exactly what I'm going to get. Now what do I do to make it do what I want? And you, and it worked. Just like a PRE console, you knew it's you threw in a BMX, you, you slap it in, you plug it in the stuff, you wired stuff up. It worked every time. If you were a group owner, you knew exactly what to expect when you purchased several dozen of them across the country. So uh, you know, my that's my experience, my personal opinion with SAS products. Uh, they and moving forward to today with the IP product and the way they've integrated both you know, IP TDM and expanded and now the IP and the, uh, the Rubicon product, it's just an evolutionary step that I think made total sense. It was great. And I know in Philadelphia, what facility I worked at, we had it there. And um, I've worked with folks who do have Rubicons. And I like it. I think it's a great streamlined uh, platform. It works really well. And that, that funky looking intercom panel you got there, I've seen that somewhere before and I, I can't seem to place it. Al? <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, you know, that's, uh, that's uh, uh, again, we're kind of known for distribution and routing and things like that. And, and you're right, Chris, uh, we, we um, have built very, very large systems. And uh, I think when, when you were at CBS, you were using all our analog equipment, right? Right, dude? Yes, yes, yes. At that point. So, yep. um, you know, of course, you know, things have, you know, progressed, you know, kind of like the iPhone. I, 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 I equate it to the iPhone, like the iPhone 3, 4, 5, and 6. It's all the same iPhone, but different, right? You know, and um, the concept is the same. Mapping sources to destinations, mapping sources to destinations through a, through a, a DSP um, based on a coefficient, at, you know, that uh, 
the the fader for that particular channel is telling you that's of course console so um it's all really distribution and um um you know, sources to destinations and mappings and stuff. So the natural progression, of course, back in those days, Chris, if you remember those frames and 32,000s, of course, there was a FET for every cross point, right? Uh, yes, or for every yes. source to a destination, you would have a FET. Well, what we did is we designed the uh, field effect transistor using the mutual conductance and putting it onto the actual summing node of the op amp. So the 10K or a, the breakout resistor or the input resistor, correction, the input resistor would be on the other side of the FET, okay? And uh, therefore, we're, all we're doing is using the mutual conductance of the FET um, to get to the summing junction of the op amp. Of course, then you got your feedback resistor. The caveat to that is every time you add to it, uh, you're going to get a huge inrush of audio energy. So it's just going to pop. Right. So that was why a lot of folks who designed audio routers back then, which were really the audio portions of video routers back then, because there was no real, quote, unquote, true. audio routing for radio. Um, they were using the FET switching in voltage mode. And therefore, the FET was on the uh, other side of the input resistor. OK. And then your feedback resistor was on the summing node, of course. You don't get the pop. You won't be able to sum either, okay, uh, with a voltage mode like that. Um, but the problem is, is you had to bias the FET, and you'd um, have a certain bias on the FET, and you'd have an input uh, signal going to the FET. You'd have to attenuate that signal so you wouldn't clip uh, the exceed the bias voltages of the FET. Generally, at that point, there were CMOS devices. Um, 4066s and stuff like that that you would bias them with plus or minus five you couldn't you couldn't uh, or ground in plus five so you couldn't go to plus minus 12 or plus or minus 18 or plus or minus 22 which is what you need for full you know proper audio um, 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 peak to peak swing so what would happen is you'd have to attenuate it so you and you'd have to clamp it because if you exceeded the input signal exceeded the bias voltage uh, of the FET, it would punch through. It would just conduct full on, right? And then, and then they they called it punch through back then. If you ever remember that, Chris, that uh, and Car and Kirk, when when you'd have a tape in wind speed, um, yep. where the heads are still engaged, and the, of course the frequency goes up and the amplitude goes up. If it exceeded that bias uh, voltages of that FET, it would just conduct full on. It would be reverse bias. So um, we we solved that problem by going in using current mode. But the problem with current mode is you get this big horrendous pop every time you you sum on a, a node, of course, because you've got a, a, a very high gain point there at the summing junction of the op amp. So what we did is we took another op amp and another FET, and we fed the, uh, that FET into an op amp and brought it in in opposite phase and summed in the opposite phase of the glitch. So when we would turn on the FET uh, for an input source, we would get a transient, okay, and then we'd sum in the opposite transient, okay? So it would null that out. So you wouldn't you wouldn't hear <laughs> the big pop uh, uh, it, when you would select something to the output, and uh, we'd null that out um, um, with uh, under microprocessor control, of course. So that was really kind of our claim to fame was was that um, was that summing you know router, and uh, the the fact that we were in current mode gave us that uh, just a natural correction, just the, 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 the benefit of being able to sum because you could sum the, resist, you know, uh, the sources on. So if you need a FET, a field effect transistor, or some kind of um, um, FET uh, switch at every input to every output, if you do the math on that, if I needed 1,000 ins to 1,000 outputs, okay, that's a million FETs, a million field effect transistors we would need to do a thousand by thousand wow. um we did a quote actually for disney um i'm gonna say 88 maybe 89 90 around that area and if you remember uh, uh guys that we had that uh, three rack unit thirty two thousand analog and again a fet for every source every output when we did that quotation it was a 15 million dollar proposition to do a thousand inputs by a thousand outputs using that particular 
uh, combination of, of uh, topology. And, uh, of course, we didn't get that job. Uh, I'm still here. But uh, any, anyway, well, that was a joke. But anyway, um, we, uh, 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 of course, now do a thousand by a thousand in a six rack unit, a six rack unit frame, you know, for a, a heck of a lot less than that. And, uh, you know, uh, you know, 20, 20 to $30,000, you get, you know, you know, you get a thousand and a thousand out. So, um, you can see how it's all progressed over the years, you know, as we migrate into digital, now we don't need a FET for every source to every destination. It's all going through a DSP mechanism. And now all we need is a port for an input port or an output port. You need hardware. If you have an analog in or an AS EBU receiver, if you've got digital in, mm -hmm. You'll have a DAC um, uh, for going at, and, an, and a, of course, a line driver for analog outs or an AES EBU driver for AES outs. Now, of course, it's a, it's a stack with a IP, so you can put multi-channel into an IP stream. So, uh, yeah, so, uh, it, it, you know, m making these systems back, uh, I think the, the largest we ever made out of a 32,000 is a... Um, uh, I'm, I'm going to say 256 by 256, which was 16 frames. Um, and uh, now, of course, the, our largest system in the digital world. And again, it's you know, it's 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 just progressed to like you know the same sources to destinations. Uh, the, one of the biggest ones now we have out there is uh, 10,000 channels uh, of audio. So 50. It's not uh, completely symmetrical, but it's 5192 by 5192. If it was symmetrical. Mm -hmm. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So, yeah. So, the, yeah, if you, uh, you, yeah. Chris, I know you, you've used a lot of our stuff. It was all punch blocks back then. Uh, now, oh, of course, yeah. it's all using uh, RJ45 and we have dongles and, you know, as everybody's RJ45 now, that's how it's kind of progressed. So a little, that's no, a little you, bit you of got... reminiscent from the old days. Hi, huh, guys. Yeah. Yeah. No, you, 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 you guys, uh, you know, you and the and the team and everybody in the division, I still think the SAS has brought the workflow to a place now with the IP integration that makes it real easy to decide which way to go and how to do it, and do it reliably and repeat it and repeat it every time. It's great. I, I I still think the Rubicon was great when we put it in Philadelphia. I remember looking at the guys talking about it like, well, wait a minute, what about this? What about that? And all of a sudden it was just like, oh yeah, we can do that. Yeah, we can do that too. And it was just nothing to it. Whereas you say we could reminisce back in the day, and it was like, well, let's see if we punch across this block here to that output there, we might be able to come up with something here. And now it's just a click of a mouse, if you will. Hey, we're going to get to talking about um, the SAS console designs in, in in a few minutes, but before we we go to uh, our next break, I want to finish up talking about about audio routing. Um, you know, so many uh, of the stations that I worked at through the years never really had any audio routing. And now that audio routing is part of what AOIP, audio over IP, can do anyway. Uh, we never had the ability before, so we we found out, you know, ways to not need it, right? But now that AOIP does that, Al, aren't you finding that that customers that maybe never had a router before now they do because they've bought an AOIP-based system and routing is just part of the equation. Oh, oh absolutely. Yeah, you know, um, the, the, even a console, even an analog, old analog console was routing in, in, in a, well, in a, yeah, in a right. certain degree. Yeah. You had sources to your buses and destinations. So, of course, now with AOIP or any transport mechanism, uh, for that matter, you, you can route. You're going to be able to route something to a, an output. And if you put um, it, route it through a DSP processor, of course, now you can emulate the console function. So you, you're exactly right. Um, now routing um, is a, kind of a... Um, I guess I want to say a byproduct, um, a free byproduct yeah. of the fact that That's what I was trying the to way say, the yeah. new, yeah, the new, with the way the new um, paradigm is now. Um, so, you know, a lot of stations that were uh, unable to either afford um, routing before, but see, but see, dude, even now, um, you know, just a plain router is so much less expensive now um, ah, to be yeah. able to get into routing. Because of the mm -hmm. of the digital technology, whether you DS, have DSP uh, to 
control level or EQ or whatever it is else you do you or you want to do with it. Um, routing is becoming so much more affordable because you don't, you know, like I was explaining, if you had a FET for every uh, source uh, to destination, that's a million FETs. That would be, uh, you know, that was $3 million <laughs> just in field effect transistors alone. So obviously wow. um, everything has come down just like digital television, right? I mean, I, I remember start, starting in television and, you know, spending back in the early 80s, uh, uh, you know, uh, $200,000 for time-based correctors or frame store uh, generators, stuff like that, just to do some editing. And now you do it with freeware. I mean, uh, so, um, yeah, so a lot of folks now, routing is just a natural byproduct of, of, the, um, uh, of the fact that you've got, you know, your consoles that are a control surface as opposed to actually control a console itself. So keyboard and mouse controlling your DSP engine. So all the DSP engine is doing is mapping a source to a destination through a DSP based on, and that DSP gain is set by a coefficient uh, determined by the uh, fader. You know, did, did uh, several times. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure does. Uh, several times, Al, you've, you've, you've referred, you've looked at your console there and, re and said, Keyboard and mouse. And I know exactly what you're saying because this is an analogy that, that I use in talking about consoles as well. There's no more audio in, in that console. There, it, it, it might as well be a keyboard and mouse controlling that, that DSP engine. So I just wanted to clarify for folks, when Al's saying keyboard and mouse, he doesn't really mean keyboard and mouse. He means a thing that looks yes. like an audio yes. console. That you know, it's 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 a cons it's it's a mouse that looks exactly like an audio console. <laughs> yeah, is, no, is no, that no, thank you for clearing that up. Uh, it, absolutely, yeah. Uh, thank you for clearing that up. Um, yeah, yes, it's it it is just really sending level control information like a like a mm -hmm. mouse would or or a switch information. Um, you know, like a you would input. Uh, data to your computer but yeah it's just uh, uh, a keyboard uh, well I shouldn't say keyboard or much but thanks for clearing <laughs> that up yeah it's actually uh, um, I yeah I, I'm so used to talking um, keyboard and mouse type thing when with control services but um, yeah that's exactly right it's just controlling uh, DSP uh, functions in the in the engine and um, uh, it's 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 really quite quite simple it's it's fairly simple from that control aspect, because in fact, yeah. you know, with iPad apps, we have iPad apps as you, as you do. Um, you don't need the control. The only reason why we're bringing out um, these controls is so that the the talents and the content pr producers can have a tactile feel, um, yeah. especially when they're reading script. And now you're reading script on an iPad or an iPhone or your screen. You kind of need somewhere to hit that. And I. And I don't know, and maybe it's just me because I'm I'm, I'm old and not a millennial, um, but you probably have come across this as well. When you're driving and trying to dial a simple telephone number, um, mm -hmm. you, you can't. You can't because the touch screen, you're always inadvertently going to miss and hit a different number. Um, where before, with the tactile feel, you can actually feel your way around the keyboard and you can still drive. So there's still going to be a certain need in some environments where you're capturing this program, uh, sp specifically sports, news events, things like that. Uh, there, you're going to need some kind of tactile feel, um, f uh, feel control of some description. Uh, yeah. Although yeah. while it's while it's getting virtualized and while you've got iPad apps and things like that, um, you know you're gonna you're gonna miss. You know, uh, an, an example of that is live sound. I mean, I, I, I um, a couple of years ago, I, I, I'm, I'm married to a, a wonderful Russian, Russian girl, and she loves the ballet, right? We went to this show one time, and the guy was mixing the entire show on an iPad. Uh, and I believe it was, um, I don't know, it was a personas or whatever it was that he was controlling all the mics and things like that, all strictly on an iPad. And he, you know, he he just missed uh, a lot of stuff. You know, microphones were late coming on. We got feedback, and he had to pull it down. Um, it, v very difficult to to mix, even though it's multi-touch and you could do many things and move faders and ride faders. The fact of the matter is, you can only get so many faders on the screen. You can only you have no tactile feel, and 
And and and honestly, I was really surprised. Um, now, you know, certainly you can be trained, and as that technology progresses and we move away from, you know, tactile control surfaces, the the new generation, I'm sure will. Oh, that's no problem. They just right, but it, <laughs> yeah. there's a there's a learning curve to it. There's there's a learning curve. Yeah. You're just not going to be able to sit down in front of a surface and um, produce sports news, uh, especially anything that's produced in in you know flawlessly. It's just not going to happen. Uh, it takes a lot of training, you know. So anyway, that that but yes, the the so the control surface can be totally replaced by just a touchpad uh, iPad or a touchscreen app of some, you know, and, and as you, as we both know, and in fact, as you talked about the Ruby, um, it's the same, same idea, right? Oh, not the Ruby. I'm sorry. The crystal that Lavo has. It's yeah, the same, yeah. same, same, same kind right. of deal. The control of using an iPad, just sending messaging to the <laughs> DSP engine. Hey, Al, we're going to take a quick break, and uh, Chris, hang on to our, our show, This Week in Radio Tech, episode 350, with Chris Tobin uh, at a uh, transmitter site in New York City, and Al Salsi at SAS in California. Uh, we're going to be talking about console design, and what are some of the particular things that SAS has designed in their consoles that make them popular with, uh, let's say, high-profile situations. I'm curious to... Uh, to know about that. I've never gotten to, as a disc jockey, never got to use an SAS console. That was in little bitty markets. Our show is brought to you in part by the folks at Broadcast Supply Worldwide. And uh, just a few more days in their promotion called Let's May a Deal. I think we have a video about that right now. Yo, Phil McCavity here for the BSW Company. You might remember me from my crack reporting from the NAB show floor. Yes? That was me. Get excited. <clears throat> Did you know that April showers bring May deals? Well, now you do. It's BSW's Let's May a Deal promo. Fresh on the heels of the 2017 NAB convention, where broadcast is king. BSW has some deals for you. Let's take a look. The Audio-Technica BPH-13 for two package. That's right. Buy two BPH-S1 broadcast headsets and receive the third free. Three for the price of two. Hmm, so if I buy two, I get a third. That third is free, but for the price of... Well, hey there. Just working out the math for you. Uh, welcome back. And oh boy, there is more where that came from. I spotted this little gem at NAB 2017. Fresh from the floor, the new Arrakis Arc Talk Blue console. Five mic channels, two Bluetooth channels, and only 1049. While it's my civic duty to BSW and broadcasters alike to inform you on the fancy schmancy deals, it is also my duty to tell you what's not for sale. The air conditioned lawnmower, the ice cube hangover mask, the hat radio. Hold on. You mean, I've been mowing my lawn without air conditioning? Ha! What will they come up with next? How about a sweet deal on a microphone processor? Mmm, yep. Air Tools 2X Dual Channel Voice Processor. Dual Channel Microphone Processor for one heck of a deal. Enter Airball on BSWUSA.com and receive $350 off this infamous processor from Air Tools. And... I'm back. <laughs> Good thing, because then s someone else would be. Then I could not afford the hat radio. Quick recap. BSW brings you savings. BSW brings you same-day shipping until 7 p.m. Eastern Time. BSW brings you almond roca candy. Sweet. Now, let's may a deal so we can get some almond roca candy. Hopefully, you'll share. If not, I have an in with the marketing guy. Thanks for watching. BSW out, or mic drop, or whatever the kids say these days. Yes, sir. Don't hear that too often. All right, thanks for BSW for sponsoring This Week in Radio Tech. And if nothing else, oh my goodness, BSW has the the best marketing of the film cavity. Uh, and you can order late at BSW because they have a warehouse uh, in the Eastern Time Zone. And up till 7 p.m. If it's in stock, it'll ship that night if you need it to. All right. We're uh, on This Week in Radio Tech talking with uh, Chris Tobin in a transmitter room and uh, Al Salsi with SAS. 
They make big consoles and little consoles and all in between consoles. Uh, Al, uh, um, uh, let's talk about this this Rubicon console, and let's, I guess, more broadly, let's talk about your your philosophy in designing an audio console. I, I, sure, all consoles are roughly the same on off channel on each fader. There's a, a you know a thing you move up and down or turn around uh, to get the volume to go up and down, and then there's buses bus assignments, but. Um, your consoles are very popular uh, among big city stations. Can you kind of give us a little bit of your de design philosophy and tell us why you why you think that is? Sure, I, I, uh, um, I'd be happy to. Um, I, I think you know when we laid out our consoles in the first place. When we, um, of course, we you know with the distribution DSP. Of course, the natural next step for us was to put a console. Uh, control service to it. Um, we got a lot of uh, input from uh, a, a lot of the big players because we were the only ones at that time who were making audio routers uh, that would fit the bill for large scaled uh, systems. Uh, so we're doing a lot of the ABCs, CBSs, CSPN, Fox News, sports, things like that. Um, so, you know, uh, our I think our first design philosophy is that is that we don't design anything because <laughs> we wouldn't know what to build uh, unless we get the feedback from what what somebody needs. So uh, we get a lot of input from our friends in 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 the uh, in in the rank you know in the trenches. Um, but you're you're right. I mean, there's only so many ways you can present on off you know uh, clip uh, correction Q IFB fader and four eight uh, or more bus send buttons. So, um, you know, in, in, at least in America, uh, they like to have the on offs down below in, in Europe, they like to ride the faders and like the on off up here or for different type of pro sounds and stuff like that. Um, but, um, when we move forward, uh, we move forward in such a way that we don't actually obsolete anything that we've done prior. So, like for instance, the 32KD is 15 years old, um, but the 32KD is is completely different today than it was 15 years ago. Kind of like <clears throat> your your iPhone, right? Uh, your iPhone 7 is different than the iPhone 2, um, but it's the same, but different. It still makes phone calls. You can still surf the internet, take pictures, things like that. Same with the 32KD. It's different today, but still kind of does the same. The same type of functions. So, with that modular approach, um, we're able to um, design products without actually obsoleting the old ones. So, uh, for example, um, you know, everything's a modular system. We have like a, a an appliance based um, an appliance based business model. So, mm -hmm. we'll build an appliance around for whatever transport it is: uh, USB, MADI, Cobranet, uh, EtherSound. Um, audio over IP, we it, it, because of the modularity, um, but not just the modularity, but it's this appliance business model. It's this appliance philosophy, and I'm I don't know if you can see this, and I might zoom in for you if you want. Um, no, but I, I, I can so. pull this, I can pull this little appliance out, and this appliance is our actually uh, I A O I P appliance. It's the Dante uh, Brooklyn module, and it mm -hmm. uh, yeah. pops in there. And it's uh, it's oh there's a closer closer shot of that but um it pops in there and now I can uh, um, still use my basic infrastructure for 32 kD this is a 32 kD example uh, and mm -hmm. still be able to manage and support new new transport technologies um, actually uh, we are a live wire licensee we just we signed up a, a few months ago um, and we can now take a live wire module. Um, whether it's your module or we use the DSP chipset, uh, so on and so forth, and create our own, I can pop that live wire module in there, and now it becomes a K, and uh, we call that the KLL or for a 32KD live wire link. This one's called the KDL for the Dante link. So we, we <laughs> can actually, um, ha with this appliance, and, and it's not just the 32KD that this uh, philosophy is applied to. It's our re all our DSP engines. All our DSP engines have a, an appliance for a trans, you know, for the transport mechanism. So our DSP engine, you can think of it um, as uh, for those in the live wire and axial world, think of it as uh, four um, 
four nodes, two input nodes, two output nodes, and a DSP all in one piece. So it's modular, um, but, um, you know, modular in groups of 16, but it's, it's uh, essentially an integrated environment. I think you've got one like that now as well. Um, but it's a complete integrated system where you've got uh, analog ins and outs, um, DSP, all functioning, all within the same box. Then there's a Cat5 on the back of that box that is transported depending on what appliance I pop ah, in there. Ah, which modules on there, sure. Yeah, yeah. Right. Now, the, uh, the example I'm showing you here is 32KD, um, but this same appliance can be popped into this any of our, en any of our engines. And mm -hmm. that Cat5 then will transport whatever it is this is, whether it's Dante, Livewire. We actually have one of these modules that is our own chipset um, that mm -hmm. is a DSP FPGA um, uh, combo. And we can pop it in this little module here. And that is a KEL. That stands for encoded audio. And that is essentially 16 stereo channels of AAC on this one module. Okay, and we can talk to third-party portables uh, such as the – that we haven't actually tested it physically with a Zephyr IP. It's been tested with mm -hmm. Varix, Lucy Live, and the Comrex Brick, uh, an AAC. Um, and we can also support G.722. But that's our next step, actually, Kirk. I, I need you to send me a, send me a, a Zephyr <laughs> IP so I can talk to, talk Al, to that and Al, we'll, if we'll I could, test uh, it out. If, it looks to me like so using that what you're calling an appliance. I would you appliance. know that little plug-in module. So uh, if if a station if if a facility wants to use Dante as their is their internal infrastructure uh, their AOIP infrastructure, mm -hmm. then they use that Dante module. If they want to use LiveWire or connect to other things that are LiveWire, they plug in that LiveWire module and there's some different firmware in there. And then you then if they want to go outside the facility with coded audio over a you know more limited bandwidth link, then you have an encoded module that does AAC uh, at at reasonable bit rates that you can get across state, across the country, or across town if you want to. That that's yeah, that, yeah. oh and and of course that's, you have AES sixty seven built in because you're you're you right. have the Dante module available. Um, wow, that is yeah, that's well, pretty it, flexible, know, isn't it? Yeah, we have a lot of options, uh, and actually, we'd be able to get AS67 now with not only the Dante module, but uh, with the <laughs> Livewire module. So, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, theoretically, we're all going to probably morph to AS67. Uh, at some point, uh, AVB may come into play, um, but that's not going to be um, um, probably anytime soon. Um you know, but the AES 67 and 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 you did a really nice uh, plug fest. I followed you on Facebook there, dude. Uh, when you were in Irvine here, um, you know, plugging in AES 67 and getting all the different uh, pieces of equipment to talk to each other. You know, we 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 actually had talked to you guys long ago about uh, l licensing Livewire. We just never signed up um, because when AES 67 became um, became um, a, um, a standard. Uh, it was uh, X what, X192 and then became a standard. Um, we figured, well, maybe we won't need it because we'll be able to talk to it uh, on on at least the audio uh, part of it on AS67. Um, but then we decided a few months ago to just go ahead and license it so that we can actually talk to um, not just your new nodes but old systems as well. You know, yeah, so yeah, sure. uh, okay. and 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 it's an appliance. I mean, it's not it's not a big a big deal. It's not a stretch for anything to. Um, you know, pop in another appliance. I figure if they come out with, um, you know, whatever the kids do these days, there's audio over a uh, coat hanger. We'll make, you know, and there's an appliance for it. <laughs> sure. We'll, we'll sure. make it, right? Uh, so that's the, the neat thing about uh, our design philosophy is that we won't um, obsolete what, what you already have. Um, yeah. Our, you know, inside our engine, it's all multi-channel as well, right? So, um, mm -hmm. yeah, we, we call it TDM, but it's really m more correctly uh, classified as multi-channel synchronous or multi-channel. So, you know, we'll still use 32KD for taking the heavy lifting off of a lot of IFB routes, for example. So, um, and again, when you get 10,000 channels, I mean, we've got... Uh, 50 plus studios, any microphone and any floor performance studios mm -hmm. can be dialed up yeah. to anywhere 
Well, that's an IFB nightmare. Um, it, you know, that's an IFB nightmare. So the 32KD kind of handles a lot of that and then gives you um, with this and the 32KD example uh, gives you the audio over IP, uh, all those options encoded, LiveWire, Dante, AVB if, if, if necessary um, around it as well. Chris Tobin, uh, you do uh, some integration yourself in facilities that that uh, it sounds like what SAS is is doing here is is helping to serve anybody, no matter what flavor of Kool Aid they they like. Uh, could you see how the, how uh, Al's scheme here can be helpful to you and in big city installations? Oh, absolutely! Ooh, but don't call, yeah, don't no. call it Kool Aid. <laughs> <laughs> don't call it Kool Aid. <laughs> that has negative connotations to it. Uh, yeah, I guess so. Chris, sorry, yeah, yeah, no, no. sorry. I just thought I'd throw a little, a little humor in because it was getting very serious here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no. Uh, Al's approach, uh, the SAS approach, makes total sense, and and a lot of facilities that have the earlier versions and have moved on to the newer stuff with SAS, it's spot on. And he's right with IFB routing. That is the one area that I have worked on on many years where people just overlook the necessary horsepower required to do it right and um, watch it collapse under certain conditions. So I, I think you know if you're a serious facility and you really understand what you're trying to do with your workflow, and whether it's 10 studios or 50, you know the SAS model is something you definitely should consider. I mean, it's, it's well thought out. And I like the fact, it's always been the case that I've been a user, so I can say this, you know, full disclosure, I've used the product. Um, the backwards compatibility, if you will, you know, the non-obsolescence. So you can really get crazy and do stuff and, make a combination of anything and with the appliance approach with the daughter bod uh, on the 32 kd you can mix and match and come up with some wild workflows and not even realize it until you sit down you know just look at it and go oh wait a minute i could do that so yeah no, I, I totally agree it's definitely a great way to go and something to be seriously thought about or, or looked at thank you thank you yeah yeah it, it and you know when when you have um uh an investment of this kind of system yeah i mean we're not buying you know, four hundred, three hundred dollar Behringers here. Uh, you're 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 paying, uh, you know, a boutique type of uh, product. You want it to last for a little while. And I and I know, you know, and I I hear oftentimes, well, you know, technology is changing so fast that you know uh, we need to keep up and everything else. Well, well, digital audio is still the same. Uh, audio over IP is still the same. It's just a different clocking mechanism or a different uh, clocking protocol. Uh, and, you know, it, it's really all the same. You, I don't think radio stations have the time or the money anymore to be able to ha change platforms every three years or five years. So, like you would buy a Mac or buy a PC, you know, uh, or a Behringer or something like that, and that's kind of disposable. We, we still believe that, you know, we build for longevity. And, uh, you know, of course, utmost reliability, um, you know, because you just don't have that luxury um, to change this kind of boutique product every every few years. And as the technology evolves, no, no problem. We, we evolve with it, whether it's the 32 KD or that appliance model in any of the engines, uh, we are able to adapt and and. Um, manage whatever whatever technologies come out again like your iphone six seven is is different than the iphone three or two but we don't make you trade in the hardware see <laughs> you get to keep your hardware <laughs> so um we we make it all backwards compatible and thank you chris for making that uh point uh for me um but yeah it's all backwards compatible uh and, and in fact um when we design things, we we apply what we call the WWGMD rule. Do any of you guys know what that is? The no, WWGMD no, rule. WGMD. That's a that's what what would GM do? Um, and uh, uh, uh. we know if if GM <laughs> and Ford and any of the automakers are using a particular part, I know that part's not going to go away anytime soon. So we make sure mm -hmm. that we're going to have a long whatever parts we choose. We see who else is using them. And it's not just, of course, GM and Ford, but if there's other folks and not Google, <laughs> if, you know, because they're going to toss parts every two years uh, because they, that's a whole other discussion with PCs and stuff. They build in obsolescence. They have to 
be able to make sure that you have to buy a new computer every few years. But that's another yeah, story. Yeah. Um, but anyway, yeah. um, you know what GM would do? I know that part is going to have a long life production cycle. So, um, you, you know, that, that's all part of our design philosophy as well. What would, w, you know, what would GM do? Who else is using the part? Build it for longevity. That's part of that longevity. Um, backwards compatibility. If, you know, we came out with a new module at, for our consoles at NAB, and this is the, the, the existing Rubicon module. Um, but, okay. you know, again, kind of the same idea that you can only present on-off faders and bus buttons in a certain way. We, have a, we, we introduced a new one that looks remarkably the same. Um, but, uh, it is, and it will line up and they will fit in the same tubs. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, we put a, a, a new, you know, display. It's a, it's a, uh, high res display along with color buttons as well. So you can program the buttons to be a, uh, a, a dim color and an on color. So you might want to program it for red if it's uh, a program bus, or you might want to program it for red at a certain point uh, in time or for a certain show and say, hey, that's red. Don't turn that off right now. We're doing a recording. Uh, yeah. uh, you know, yeah. we're getting a recording. I don't want you to disrupt that feed. So because, you know, with our, our equipment with uh, in, in these major markets, and I think, again, another reason why they've embraced us is because um, we allow them to do many functions offline as well. Um, but you can see these are two different modules. Um, but uh, they'll 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 fit in the same console together. Faders sure. line up, sure. just you know, just uh, different but the same, right? So it's it's hey, kind of neat uh, that. Uh... Oh, go ahead. Al, we're yeah. going to take a, a, one more quick break, and I tell you what, right after this break, we got to wrap the show up. We we ask our guest, and and Chris Tobin always does too. Give us a little tip, a little tip of the week, tip for the show. Uh, and hey, Al, I know you love flying. He'd be a tip about flying. It could be a okay. tip about audio consoles, so just it's going to need to be quick because we're running out of time. Our show this week in Radio Tech is brought to you in part by uh, my friends and my employer at the Telos Alliance. The Telos Alliance has this weekly e-newsletter that I'm always so excited about. Mine just came in today because it's every Thursday, and um, the top art, the top uh, 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 article, if you will, uh, the top story: AES 67 goes far beyond studio walls. Uh, there's you can read more, but uh, it's an article about AES 7 allowing facilities to flexibly use and access any and all devices connected to a network with almost zero latency and full resolution. AES 7 a, a real game changer. And Greg Shea explains all about this with a very in-depth Q and A from the folks at Broadcast Bridge. If you just click if you if you get the uh, e newsletter uh, from Telos, it's called Direct Current. Then uh, you can read all about that and see what Greg Shea who is our chief uh, science officer, uh, says ab ab about this. There's another story about uh, an Axia console installation in Tennessee. friend of mine, um, uh, Dave Wilson of Worldwide Network Services, uh, did this installation. So a co cool article there. Um, and uh, scrolling down a bit more, there's a Studio Geek Finds Career in Lost Wallet. Well, that could be interesting, and the full details are there. Upcoming events, the New Mexico Broadcasters Convention, Wisconsin Broadcasters Summer Engineering Conference. Uh, I'm going to be there for that in the middle of June in Sheboygan. Uh, also, Infocom is coming up the same days as uh, the WBA in Orlando. Um, and the Montana Broadcasters Association is meeting at the end of July. Plus, SIMPTI in Sydney, Australia is coming up uh, July 18th through 21st. I hope I'm going to that. Not sure yet. We'll see. Um, so lots of things to check out. There's always good articles in Direct Current, uh, the Direct Current e-newsletter. And you know how to get yours? Well, just go to telosalliance.com slash direct current. All like all one word, direct current, one word. Telosalliance.com slash direct current and sign up for that newsletter. Uh, you'll get it every Thursday. You can unsubscribe anytime, of course, and it's valuable information. Yeah, there's some cool stuff in there about uh, Telos, Omnia, Axia, Linear Acoustic, 25.7, uh, those brands, Minnetonka Audio as well. Uh, but there's also uh, cool stories like this AES67 story with Greg Shea and a real in-depth look. Thanks a lot, Telos Alliance, for sponsoring this week in Radio Tech. And uh, I'm going to hit up, hit up uh, uh, Chris uh, Tobin first for our tip of the week. Chris always has one. Chris, what you got for us, buddy? 
I have two tips real quick. Uh, first one is to uh, to reinforce what Al's been talking about when we were mentioning when he was mentioning this uh, system design, console design. He, he, what he's touching on, and what people overlook all the time, and it just goes back earlier in the conversation regarding the uh, touch screen and, and trying to mix a, a ballet with an iPad, which is very, mm -hmm. uh, very nice, but form factor wise, it's way too small for the fingers to work. Anyway, it's about workflow. And the trick is understanding the workflow that you have. So yes, you could buy the cheap, we'll say Behringer mixer and maybe get what you think the workflow should be done properly until things get really busy. Then suddenly you realize the shortcomings. Or if you're doing a business like as a radio station, you look at what makes sense, you spend the extra dollars so that when things do get busy because you've increased your workflow because that's what generates the money, now you've got a product that's under your fingertips that works with it. And that's the difference in price and that's how you should look at it. Don't look at it just because, oh, that's a $300 box and this is a $15,000 box. Well, I can't afford $15,000. Well, the reality is you probably can because can you afford not to have the workflow that generates the money? That's tip mm. number one. You'll have to read further into that. I'm not going to give you the business tricks. That'll cost you a couple of dollars. <laughs> yeah. second, the second tip is, uh, I, I, I say this from experience, we talk about the console, the workflow stuff. And, sa and Al knows this. It's about the workflow. And if you do it right, it comes back and, and it pays back very well. But you have to have a vision and understand that. And that's the difference. Second tip, real quick, Suncast, if you pop up the, uh, the image I sent you, great. Now, you see here, this looks like a simple room in a, in a facility. And you got some copper pipes in front of you. And, yes, I had to block out the call letters. But those are two transmission lines. That happens to be from the Myatt folks in New Jersey. And one of them is an actual DTV, Channel 24, which is several tens of thousands of watts of RF going through it. And the other one is for an FM station, uh, also several thousand watts going through it. But the room that this is going, traversing through, this is not the transmitter room for the respective TV or FM radio station. This happens to be the contractor's room where they stage and set up the contract work and all the engineers, electricians, everybody's coming and going for the work being done in the building. Mm. Signage. I've said this before. Label, label, label. Make sure you tell people what not to do or what to do. Read the sign very carefully. Warning. Do not hang anything on the copper pipes. Okay? Because yeah. we know what happens in a room that are not broadcast folks. Hey, look, there's a pipe. I'll hang my coat here. Do that a couple of times into a copper transmission line. I'm pretty sure you'll find a nice uh, fatigue point, and next thing you have is a nice arc welding plasma machine in your room. <laughs> yeah. So oh. so remember, look at the obvious and go step back. And go, oh, wait a minute. We should maybe label this. And the reason you label is I was up at the World Trade Center last week when I was we did the, the show, and I got the chance to look at a Rode Schwarz uh, UHF TV transmitter. It's going to be going online shortly up there. And they were running tests into the dummy load at 68,000 watts. Uh, I kid you not, you could have a conversation at a whisper next to this transmitter. You would hmm. never know that it was on. I Seriously. They, had to, they have lights, uh, LED displays that tell you in red, this box is active. There is actual RF coming out of here. So that's it's even more important now than ever to label everything you do. So there you have wow. workflow and labels to go together. Good advice. Good advice. And uh, Al, would you like to provide us with a a tip of the week, sir? Oh uh, sure. Can I can I can I be funny? Don't eat yellow snow. Uh, keep the dirty <laughs> side down. Yeah. Um, for, for flying, you always keep the dirty side down, shiny side up. No, I, I, actually, um, uh, it's it's uh, uh, to uh, confirm what what Chris was saying. Work workflow. Uh, you know, look at the application. Use the the right product for the application. Make sure you don't you don't cut yourself short or sell yourself short uh, on you know what what the application is. Um, and make you know use the right tool for the right job. Uh, the other one. Uh, again, and Chris, you must have been reading my mind because uh, uh, along with make sure you label everything, I was going to suggest make a, a log in information and password information management. As things are getting more and more virtual now, um, you, you know, there's some neat stuff out there to help you manage logins and passwords and whatever you do, don't put them on the cloud. Uh, otherwise, somebody can grab your whole life. But uh, Anyway, I thought that would be be kind of kind of cool. And uh, make sure uh, when you're uh, 
you know, you do your pre-flight and keep that dirty side down. We didn't talk about airplanes at all, dude. What's, what's I know up? we're out this, of, we're this out went of time. Fast. I'll add. Yeah, I'll add my no tip problem. to them. No problem. Al, thank you for the. Uh, I always heard keep the greasy side down and keep the oh, pointy yeah. end forward. The pointy end of the plane. <laughs> yeah, those forward. Yes, yes. That's right. That's right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Alf, I got to thank you for joining us today. Uh, appreciate you taking an hour, hour and a half of your time to be with us. Uh, it's great to have you and hear from uh, the genius behind SAS. I appreciate it. Oh, uh, well, well, you're too kind, and 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 I'll tell you, those close-up shots of me are kind of scary. You're a lot better <laughs> looking on camera than I am. I have to tell you, no, no, you know, and you know, my my, uh, you know, uh, I was going to tell you another joke, but no, you, uh, those scary shots, those are scary. But you look great on camera, dude. I, I'll tell you. Uh, anyway, thank you for having me. I really appreciate uh, the uh, opportunity to chat. Always a pleasure to talk with uh, both of you guys uh, and Chris Tobin. And it was great seeing you at NAB. I got a picture of you in our booth right behind SAS stuff, dude. Yes, uh, Chris, yes. Uh, Kirk did it. I grabbed him going, guys, yeah, Kirk, you're coming over here. Take a picture. We took a selfie, I think. <laughs> anyway, yep, that was sure, a lot sure of fun. Did. We sure did. Great NAB. Uh, great thanks NAB. so much. By the way, uh, yeah. our, our, live, uh, our live stream is getting a lot of comp, uh, comments. Uh, folks, love you, Al. Uh, we we appreciate you being with us. Chris Tobin, thank you for taking the time oh, to, you. Uh, thank you. To, to come to us from the transmitter site. Uh, always Absolutely. appreciate where you come. Yep. Absolutely. Uh, this Week in, in Radio Tech has been brought to you by the folks at Lavo, also by BSWUSA.com, and by my friends at the Telos Alliance. we got to go. Uh, thanks to Suncast for producing our show. He works really hard, gets it done. Thanks so much. It always ends up looking great. And thanks to Andrew Zarian, the founder of the GFQ Network. We got to go. We'll see you next week on This Week in Radio Tech. Bye-bye, everybody.